everybody. Welcome back to the Bridging the Gap series, where we're talking about AI and industrial automation, or if you like it more complicated, AI and IA. Mm. Uh, in this series, we're going to be talking about the state of implementation, budgets, challenges with AI. This episode should be another great one. In this one, we are talking about AI implementation in the near future, so how companies are actually using this, implementing, implementing it into their processes. Uh, we will also have our guest with us again, Jeff Winter, who is a uh, digital transformation industry 4.0 and AI specialist. So he'll be talking to us a little bit later as, uh, as we go through all of this. Mm, exactly. We need no introduction, but just so you do know, I am Tyler Wall. I'm Gary Cohn. Happy to have you back with us. So just a, a, a couple of quick things about AI before we get too deep into the weeds here. Uh, we'll see if Media and Technology, the company that happily pays us occasionally. Mm. Um, we do cover a lot of these different markets. So everything that we cover, all the verticals that we cover, whether that's industrial automation, manufacturing operations, uh, commercial construction, or cybersecurity, that's basically the suite of our content sites, Every one of these is touched by AI, which is why we wanted to start this research study. So we've done some research where we talk to people across all of these verticals and across all job titles. So we have people from the C-suite on down to people on the plant floor who have been answering these questions mm -hmm. about AI and how it is impacting industrial automation. We got some really interesting answers throughout this that, that have uh, given us some insight into AI and how it's being used. Yeah, and one of the bigger questions that was answered in this portion was about measuring the success within AI implementation and how people are, as I just said, measuring the success. Uh, one of the top ways are they're measuring it is just through just general efficiency improvements. I mean, 76% of respondents uh, stated that as one of the big measuring points, and then there's cost reduction at 66%, and the third one is a 55% increase in predictive accuracy. So, I mean, there's a lot to go off of there in terms of helping you in your own journey at your company uh, determine if if it's successful or not. Absolutely, yeah. And, and, and it will keep, I mean, this is going to be a moving target. So measuring the success is something that you can't, you're never going to be done with. This will be changing as time goes on. It's something you're going to have to keep measuring. Well, and what an excellent segue you set me up for. Um, it's not, it's like I knew what the next slide was going to be. Almost just like you did know that. Uh, so one of the next points we had our respondents answer to was just the future advancements in AI for IA. Uh, what a statement that is. Uh, one of those is, again, the top one was efficiency improvements. Then the next would have been increase in predictive accuracy. And then the third, uh, next closest, was just general cost reduction. So a lot of the same indicators as before are going to be referenced uh, in the future, just some of them swapped a little bit, but in general, I mean, just general efficiency across the plant is just how um, uh, success in measuring will be. Will and, and this is something that we talked to Jeff about quite a bit throughout this whole series of uh, Bridging Gap, mm -hmm. but that idea of a reduction, and these were both in these future advancements, a reduction in manual tasks. It's not really replacing humans, it's taking humans out of tasks that maybe humans shouldn't have been doing in the first place. Yeah. But one of the things that was on that future advancements uh, slide that we had is improved safety. Now, it's not a huge uh, number of respondents, it was 17% mark improved safety. But when you're talking about the plant floor and operations, safety is paramount. And, mm -hmm. and in our first episode of this, we referenced some people who said that they had safety concerns about AI. Yeah. So it's nice to see people talking about, they think in the future, this will and could make the plant floor mm -hmm. and manufacturing operations safer. Yeah, yeah, safety is definitely the number one priority, in the plant at least, for sure, on the ground level. Uh, in terms of applications to be implemented first, um, uh, Good 66% of our respondents think that predictive maintenance systems uh, will be the spot where artificial intelligence is implemented first, followed by 48% with quality control systems and 46% with energy management systems. So, I mean, again, like we've been saying for this whole podcast, the previous one, uh, just general efficiency gains and quality control are definitely big areas. And nothing surprising here. Robotics, safety and security. I mean, we gave them the categories, but these are uh, these are not surprising, but these are the ones that people would No, they're not. Uh, the other thing that we talked about a lot in our first episode was um, some of the challenges about implementation, some of the lack of trust with AI technologies. So in this section, we wanted to talk about risk factors associated with AI adoption. So we asked... Um, our data set, you know, what concerns about data security and privacy are out there for you? What are you worried about? And some of the ones that came up, it sort of ran a wide gamut, but some of the ones that came up were cybersecurity risks, which is right up here in IL, mm -hmm. your and my IL. Yes, it is. Say this, because uh, 
We have a whole other little podcast series mm-hmm. that we do, the ICS Pulse podcast, where we talk about cyber security. Yes, so, we do. Uh, but that that actually makes sense. And Jeff will talk a little bit about those data privacy concerns and risks and the things that maybe people should be worried about about you know uh, offering up company secrets and their special sauce to uh, a publicly facing AI company, not walling off your AI. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, Data collection and usage, same kind of thing. Uh, Third-party vendors and storage, that's another big concern. It comes down to that data privacy concern is you are giving your information to a third party or if that third party's systems are not safe, Mm -hmm. then maybe your systems are not safe. So there was a lot in here about data. And then there there were actually some pretty big concerns about uh, bias and transparency, which again, Jeff will go into in quite a bit of detail later, but... um, But it makes sense. I mean, we have seen, as people have played with generative AI platforms like ChatGPT, we've seen that the kind of information that you put into a generative AI platform, it'll give you what it's been fed. So if you are feeding it things that are that are racist, that are biased, that are, it will spit out things that are like that. So that bias, it is a concern, but it's all really about putting good data, good information in. It will. And uh, I mean, Jeff will get into it, but addressing these risk factors, it's going to come down to ultimately, I mean, A, education, but B, regulation. But we'll let him dive into those fun little details. He's a little smarter than we are. Just a touch. I would say he's a lot smarter mm-hmm. than we are combined. I mean, he is a little smarter than both of us combined. Mm-hmm. His hair is definitely better than ours is. I'll, I'll take it. Let's continue. I'll, I'll take the hit. Mm-hmm. Um, we also asked people about the timing for the usage of uh, AI and production processes. We've talked throughout this about how this is being adopted. It is steadily becoming common practice for AI to be used. Now it's a question of how it can best be used. What is it good for? What is it bad for? But as far as that timing, we had some people who said they were unsure. We had 25% of people. But if you look at it, if it's not in your work, if it's not in your workflow at this point, it's going to be soon. Next 365 days, 24% of people said that. Already using it and fully implemented, 23% of people said that, which yeah. shouldn't be that surprising. A qu- almost a quarter of people. Next 90 days, 50%. Next 180 days, 13%. So, I mean, we have 25% unsure. 75% of people think that within the next year, AI will be part of their production process. And you know what? I'd bet. I'm a betting man. I would bet that those 25% unsure will see that change in the next five years. So, <laughs> I think that's probably accurate. Uh, we, we also talked about, um, because there are concerns about, we hear it over and over, I can't think of a better way to say this, AI is going to replace humans. It's going to take your jobs. It's coming to take your jobs. Uh, we did ask about, will AI lead to reduction in human labor? Uh, do you agree or disagree with this? 42% agreed with it. Uh, Jeff has some stats that contradict that a little bit. The 42% do agree that it will be a lead to a reduction in human labor. It actually seems to be creating more jobs as of right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, 24% were neutral, 19% disagreed, uh, 15% strongly agreed. So, I mean, if you look at that, we had almost 60% of people thinking it is going to, really, to, to lead to a reduction in, human, in the human workforce. Um, again, that has not borne out at this point. We'll get into that a little bit later, but, uh, but we'll see what happens in the future. Yeah, and getting into AI replacing traditional automation methods, I mean, 83% of respondents kind of hit it right on the head. AI will complement traditional automation but not fully replace it. So I don't think you can expect to see just your regular industrial automation to go away. It's more of something that will uh, be more of a, a relationship that's a little more symbiotic. You know, it's helping it out and elevating it to the next level to help your plant flow. And you need, I think that's, that's true with AI across the board. You're going to need, especially in industrial automation, uh, creative thinking human people who understand these machines, these processes, how they work, to be there implementing it on the plant floor. AI can complement it and actually maybe make your job easier or make you more effective at the job that you're doing. Mm. Humans. And one more, one more data point before we uh, have Jeff step back in here and we talk to him again. Uh, just the level of trust for safety and critical tasks. I mean, People generally think that they believe both AI and human operators can be uh, equally trusted together. Uh, 53% of people think that, and then 34% think that human operation, human operated systems are just a higher level of trust, and then AI-based systems are 13%. So it's just interesting, again, to see that, you know, the majority of people are 
pretty comfortable with AI and humans interacting on that level. And it does make sense that there is still a little bit of distrust out there for all the reasons we talked about in the first episode. It is a little bit of an unknown still for a lot of people, but I think the more people interact with it, the more people work with it, the more people understand what AI is good at and what it's not good at. I, I think that, I mean, for some people, I'm sure the level of, the, the, there will always be distrust. Yeah. But I think for most people, the more often you work with it, the more trusting you'll be in it. Yeah, definitely. And with that, we're going to go ahead and bring in Mr. Jeff Winter. Jeff, thanks so much for being back with us. I'm excited for round two. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't scare you the first time, yeah, which no. we'll do it this time. All right, let's go. Let's let's give some uh, some plaudits here to Jeff before we get started. I'm going to go ahead and read these off for accuracy. Jeff is an industry 4.0 thought leader and influencer. In fact, he's number one in the world, according to Analytica. Congratulations. He's been recognized 13 times as being a top leader in his field. He's amassed 80,000 followers on LinkedIn and is regarded as, one, as, is regarded as one of the top AI influencers. He's also known as a guy to help bring complex topics and explain them simply to a wide audience from the shop floor all the way to the top floor. So good guy to have on this podcast. He can say, explain some concepts to us. Uh, in this section, we're going to be talking a little bit more about how AI is being adopted, how it's being used, and how it can help. Um, to start us off on that, can you help describe some of the more common KPIs, key performance indicators, that organizations should be considering when they're measuring the success of an AI adoption in their organization or in industrial automation? So I think it's a great question. What's interesting is even with the ramping up of AI adoption and experimentation right now, the KPIs for AI still are an exception rather than the rule. If you actually look at a report that came out by Manufacturing Leadership Council on industrial AI earlier this year, they found that 61% of AI projects had no metrics to evaluate its success. That's astonishing, and that tells you that companies are investing in the technology with not entirely knowing how they're gonna grade it. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things that makes AI interesting when it comes to answering the question, well, okay, they're not using it, but what should our KPIs be? AI is a technology that's usually managed by the IT teams or more specifically the data science teams just because of the background on how to actually do AI model deployment and, and um, you know, fine tuning and all these aspects of actually making the AI work in the business environment. And when you leave it up to them, because they may be the only ones that actually understand it, their natural tendency is to do AI model KPIs, not just the KPIs for the AI itself. And let me kind of explain the difference. So they're looking at making the AI algorithm or model work correctly. So they're gonna be measuring things like accuracy and recall and precision to, to evaluate how good that model is. But how good the model is may or may not actually impact the business that you're trying to look at. So you do need to switch to the business outcomes that you're trying to achieve. Things like productivity enhancement, cost reduction, labor savings. You need to figure out what is the AI supposed to do, not just reporting on AI usage and the accuracy of the AI. Mm -hmm. are, are, are there some overlooked KPIs that, that could bring more ROI to manufacturers, things that they should be looking at? This entirely depends on the application. There is no silver bullet for that because of the application ubiquitousness of AI. It can apply to every single function. So I'm currently working with manufacturers with AI in their legal department, their finance department, their engineering department, their maintenance department, their quality department, their production department, their supply chain, their inventory. The KPIs are gonna be different for, for all of that. They're also gonna be different if you're using it to augment your decisions to help you or to automate. How you grade its success is entirely different. And then it gets more complicated when you when you sort them out by sub-vertical because how you make a cookie is a lot different than how you make a car and how you're going to evaluate where AI is used and its effectiveness is different. So there, unfortunately there are no singular answers unless you had a very specific use case in a specific industry for KPIs. The general guidance is link them to your business outcomes, kind of like you would any other technology adoption. Don't get sucked down the rabbit hole of evaluating the AI model effectiveness itself. Look at how effective AI is at driving the outcomes that you want. So what are some common mistakes organizations make when attempting to measure the success of AI adoption and how can they avoid them? 
<laughs> so there's, I'd say, a, a whole bunch here, and part of them are fueled by the fact that most companies don't have metrics to evaluate the success of their artificial intelligence. I'd say one of the first ones is not a good data strategy. AI is built off of having good data, good quality data, available when you need it. And most companies don't have an answer for that. In fact, if you actually look at this, I love kind of sharing some of these statistics on data in general to show you how much it's proliferated over the past few years. Eric Schmidt, the former CEO of Google, famously said in 2010 that the amount of data generated since the dawn of civilization all the way up until 2003 was five exabytes worth of data. And you don't even need to know what that is, but it, it sounds impressive. Sounds big. But if we fast forward to 2023, according to Statista, we are staring at a staggering 120 zettabytes worth of data that's going to be generated this year alone. And to put that in perspective, that actually means that we're going to be generating about 24,000 times the amount of data in 2023 as we did in all of civilization up until 2003. In fact, we're actually pumping out five exabytes worth of data every couple of hours now. And you may be wondering what industry is producing or collecting that data. It's not healthcare. It's not finance. It's not retail. The number one industry that is collecting data is manufacturing. According to Morgan Stanley, it's almost twice any other industry that's out there. And now here's the, the sad reality though, mm -hmm. is that if you were to look at the roughly 2,000 petabytes worth of data collected over the past 10 years, according to Industrial Internet Consortium, we've let 99% of that data slip away. And then even starker realities, according to Splunk, 55% of enterprise data is a mystery. It's unknown or unused by anyone in the company. So how are you going to appropriately take advantage of AI if you're not using the data that you have or have a data strategy around what data you should be collecting or what data you are collecting? Because the other interesting part about data is for your department, it may be useless, but that doesn't mean it's useless to your company. You'd be surprised at what the marketing department or sales department would love to know about production data but they don't know that it's available. So that is probably the biggest one I'd say is just lack of efficient data strategy, which needs to be there before an AI strategy. The other is putting the cart before the horse. Like I said, people are applying AI just as fast as they can without really knowing where to apply that technology and the ramifications and implications of the processes and the people that come along with it. Because the technology is arguably easier than other technologies to implement, they're putting the cart before the horse is a big one. Um, I would say another one that people look at that I think they generally want to do, but they're not fully aware of its implications is the ethical concerns and the privacy concerns behind this. People generally want to do it right, but they don't necessarily know how to do it right. And data privacy is another big one that comes into play, whether you're inputting your information into the public chat GPT and not being aware of it, or you're not aware of how the models are being trained inside your company for what data is shared with whom based off of what's accessible to the AI models. So you really need to have good policies and strategies in place for both the ethics and the privacy of of your data. So as you can see here, a lot of this kind of comes around to the, the data strategy that you have. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. I mean, we, we've talked about this before, but we, as you said, we collect so much data now, and especially in manufacturing in every one of the verticals that we cover. That big question is, yeah, what do you do to it? You know, what do you do with it? Can you action, is it actionable? Can you do something with it? And can you use AI? It. And I may even add one to that is I actually think that a lot of companies overstate AI's capabilities. The real AI engineers they have, or if you have any PhD data scientists, they will have a better understanding of what it can do and what it can't. But the average person or the leaders, they see these beautiful case studies that are powerfully transforming companies, and then they just think it's, it's the answer to everything. And they're overstating what it's really good at versus what it's okay at versus what it's not very good at yet. Right. Yeah, makes sense. I, I think we asked our audience this question in the research, but where do you, where do you think we're going to see the most significant advancements in AI for IA or for industrial automation in the near future? I mean, are we talking about technology, process, skills training, predictive maintenance? Where do you see that? 
coming in? So it's a good question. I'll answer more broadly for AI overall and then specifically for industrial automation. So if you break it into those three areas of, I'm going to say, like the technology, the process, and, and the people side, I absolutely think it's going to be in the technology. That's where we're going to have the biggest advancements that are coming out. If you look at just the speed at which technology is being released, it's faster than we even know how to, to handle it. Let's use ChatGPT as an example. It came out in November of 2022. And within months, you know, it had 100 million users and would just completely disrupted the world. And then a couple months after that, they came out GPT-4. So right after this powerful thing came out, they came out with a model that blew the old one out of the water. So that's just to show one example of you're going to start to see these technologies coming out that have profound impacts on a more regular basis. So that's probably the, the biggest one that's out there. We're also going to see kind of as a society level, a lot more changes when it comes to the regulations and policy and governance around AI. And so that one doesn't directly impact the technology immediately, but it impacts where you use it and how people are related to the use of it. So that's going to be a big one. But if you were to go down a layer to specifically industrial automation, I say the biggest things that we're going to see there is uh, an advancement in computing and edge technology that allow AI to be run more locally. Because right now, most companies are fine with a lag in the answer because they don't need real time with AI. So you can go pull the information to the cloud, you can analyze it, you can get your insights, and you can use it to make decisions because an hour may be sufficient for most jobs and what you're looking for. Even Three minutes may be sufficient, but real time and process control where you need decisions made in milliseconds, you have to run AI locally and you need to have high horsepower right now to be able to run some more advanced AI algorithms. So we're going to see a big push in edge computing that allow manufacturers to run AI locally real time on their processes for process optimization. So let's change gears here a little bit. I mean, we talk to a lot of people in the industry and a lot of people are worried about AI just generally replacing humans. And in this case, their jobs. I mean, job security is their concern. So in cybersecurity, the idea is that AI has kind of routinized uh, the, some of the more difficult tasks and the tedious tasks that um, just kind of, kind of turn off your brain and you just kind of do. Uh, do you feel like this is a legitimate concern for industrial automation and their people's jobs being replaced? And how does the introduction of AI and industrial processes impact the required skill set for workers and engineers? So this is a good question where I think the fear is greater than the reality of this. Uh, World Economic Forum just came out with their jobs report for 2023, the future of jobs report. And in there they talk about the disruption in the industry it's happening. And right now technology is the largest driver and it will be for the foreseeable future in the change in business and how people work. AI is just one of many technologies that are in there. But they actually state how there is going to be a 35% anticipated need and change of worker skills due to, due to technology out there. In fact, generative AI alone, 50% of tasks for, uh, for workers, of 19% of workers, we think can be automated in the short term. That's a huge disruption if you look at individual skills and individual people. But that's looking at the disruption, not necessarily the replacement in jobs overall. In fact, of all the technologies that they had, almost everyone created more jobs than it displaced in terms of the technology. In fact, what I remember in there is there's only one technology that actually displaced more jobs than it replaced, and that happened to be robotics. But AI actually created more jobs than it displaced. Now, that means that individual jobs may change a lot, for example. Like if you look at the top most impacted jobs, if you look at the bottom five, four of them were related to different clerk-related jobs. But if you look at the top 10 created jobs that are out there, eight of the top 10 were data related. So they're taking advantage. In fact, the number one job that is being requested right now is AI and ML engineer. So you're seeing a bigger push in kind of the, the shifts that are, that are happening within the job market. But it absolutely will require an upskilling and a reskilling of all the workers that there. It's going to shift the way that people work because AI is very good at replacing repetitive and mundane tasks. Which means that if you were to look at this report also, it goes, what are the biggest skills that are going to be needed in the next three years? Creative thinking was number one. And uh, analytical thinking was number two. 
Those are the biggest skills that people need. If you were to look 10 years ago, they weren't the top skills that were out there. That just shows you what they're needing people to do right now because we've got all this technology, we need people to figure out how to take advantage of it and what to do with all the insights it's gaining us. And do we actually know how to take action based off those insights? We talked about this a little bit in the last episode when we were talking about trust in AI. But what are some of the risk factors with AI that you're most concerned about? Whether that's cybersecurity, compliance, what's on your radar right now? The, the three biggest concerns I would have for companies is going to be, one is explainability. And this could be very related to, um, to transparency. But transparency is just making aware of how it, everything's working and what your company plans on doing with it. Explainability is much more specific in each use of AI. If your company's using it, especially for high risk applications or anything that could be potentially customer facing or anything related to people, if you're gonna use it for HR, for performance reviews, for hiring, for firing, for evaluation, you better be sure that you understand how it came up with its decision. You be able to think about it if you had to defend it in a court of law, would you be able to explain how the AI actually made its decision? That's one that you as a company, you need to have an answer for that. Because that'll help shape where you rely on it and where you use it to either completely make the decision for you or just being one of several factors that helps you as a human still ultimately make the decision. So that's going to be one of the biggest ones is explainability. The other is going to be related to data privacy. So data privacy is very interesting with AI because of the nature in which the models are trained. They need data and they need more and more data in order to get better and better and better. There's very few technologies that rely on data to get better rather than just data one time to make the product work. So those AI models that need to get better, they constantly are going to be requesting data, whether it's from your internal employees, whether it's from your machines, whether it's from your customers or your suppliers. So you need to make sure that you understand where you're, you're dancing the line of data privacy internally and externally, and whether your employees are aware of it when they use other people's software that has AI embedded in it, that you're probably helping feed their models as part of it. So that's gonna be a big one that companies need to have a strategy around. And then the last one is gonna be around bias and fairness. And this really, is only specific to when you're dealing with people. It's not gonna be as much if you're using it for let's just say process optimization or defect detection or anomaly detection on the process line. But whenever you're using it for anything related to a person, I mean, AI has had many cases of demonstrating bias and unfairness in its answers and coming up with things that you probably wouldn't choose on your own. So you need to understand how that works. Actually, there's a lot of the major AI companies have now released their own um, policies around this. Microsoft made a, a big stance, I think it was a 27-page paper they released on how they do ethical and responsible AI, and they made it available to the public. And I think Google followed and Amazon and IBM and Oracle and all these companies have now released that because they want to help other companies come up with their own answers for how to do AI ethically and responsibly. It's also nice when the major companies like the Microsofts and Apples and the Googles, they release this because I think it does force everybody else to do it as well. And then we get a little bit more transparency as we go. Yeah. Absolutely. Jeff, again, terrific information. Thank you so much for being with us and uh, educating Tyler and I a little bit about on a a AI. I mean, we have our research, but, you know, we're not that bright. No. So we do appreciate having you come, come on here again. Thanks so much. Thanks for, for having us. me. Well, that's another excellent conversation with Jeff Winters, wouldn't you say? I would say. I feel like I've been put on the spot here. Like, what kind of person would I be if I said no? Yes, it was another interesting guy. No, it was great stuff there. He had a lot of really interesting insights on this and, and, and to different areas of, uh, of AI adoption. One of the things that stuck with me, I, I guess as a skeptic, I can't say I was surprised by it, mm -hmm. but it definitely wasn't. I'm going to read the stat here because I want to get it right. Uh, just 22% of people said that they had a specific set of metrics in place to measure AI deployment effectiveness and impact, and only 60 are in, not only, and 61% report that there are no metrics in place. Um, not surprised by this, but it's a lot of what Jeff talked about there is 
we're still learning what AI can do, and we've got this avalanche of data coming at us. We yeah. need to figure out how to measure it. Like everything else we do in business, we need to know what these KPIs are. We need to know how we can measure it. We need to know whether it is effective or not. Um, you know, you, you became more productive over the last quarter. Was it because of AI? Was it not because of AI? We need to put those guardrails in place to make sure that we know what we're talking about and what the impact is. So that's, um, I think part of that stems from this is such a new technology and we are uh, running pretty fast with it. It's being implemented quickly. Jeff mentioned in, in one of his answers that with ChatGPT, it doesn't take a lot of training. You can just throw it out there and let your employees yeah. have it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's part of the reason that some of this stuff exists. We're moving so fast with it, we haven't actually created some of the, the metrics that we need to be able mm. to measure it. Yeah, I also like what Jeff was talking about too, you know, when we were talking about the common mistakes organizations are making currently. I mean, they're putting the cart before the horse. They're, they're, they're running before they're walking here, you know? They, they are putting out AI in their systems and like advertising these different solutions, but they're like, you know, half-baked. They're just kind of like there, they kind of exist. Um, where they should be, I mean, I get that with a the version two, they'll probably be much more, you know, well thought through and things like that. but. Um, yeah, these companies are just, they don't have their ob clear objections and objections, clear objectives in place before, uh, before actually launching like an artificial intelligence system or integrating it completely. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I, I tried. So I was so close to saying run before you could walk in mm -hmm. the last thing. I'm glad I left that for you. Yeah. Uh, the other thing that he mentioned that I thought was really interesting is just how fast this technology is moving. Should not be a surprise to, to anybody. We know that AI is moving quickly. When we asked him what he thought the, the big breakthroughs would be, the next breakthroughs, he said it's going to be in that technological side. And he mentioned, again, it's the thing that we all kind of have a touch point with is ChatGPT. You know, if they, uh, they open AI, released it to the public, great, we can all use it. We've got 3.5, it's great. And then months later, version 4.0 was out and it was a, a game changer, totally different than 3.5. And that kind of speed, as people are putting more and more data into ChatGPT or into any AI system that you are using, the technology is going to move really fast. So, yeah, it'll, it'll, it'll be adapt. We'll have to adapt as it moves. Yes, we will. But one of the ways that you can help adapt yourself is by like like visiting controlengineering.com, which is control n c o n t r o l e n g dot com. I think you got that right. I think I got that right too. It's a mouthful every time and plantengineering.com, uh, where you can learn more great information about artificial intelligence, but also other things, uh, depending on the site you're on, and just general industrial automation as a whole. And if you're worried about the cybersecurity aspects of uh, implementing AI into industrial automation, you can also check us out at industrialcybersecuritypulse.com. If you want to type that out a little bit quicker, icspulse.com works too. But we talk about the cybersecurity impact of AI. And if you want to listen to Gary and I talk more, you can also go over there and find our podcast, the ICS Pulse Podcast, where we talk with other industry uh, practitioners about the topic as a whole. That's the important part. It isn't just us. We have people come on who are smarter than we are. You will actually hear experts talking, but, uh, but I'm sure you're not saying this yet. Yes. And if you want to reach us, of course, uh, you can reach me at twall at cfemedia.com. And I am at G Cohen, G-C-O-H-E-N, at cfemedia.com. Definitely keep watching out for this series and bridging the gap. You know, we're, we're going to keep bringing back Jeff Winter to talk about AI, but our next segments are going to be really important. It's going to be about the strengths and weaknesses of AI. So we'll talk a little bit about what it does well, what it doesn't do well, and what people are perceiving that it does well and not well, which... Sometimes can be a little off too. And then in the, uh, in the fourth segment, we'll be talking about the business impact of implementation of AI. So a lot of good stuff still to come in this series. Yes. But until then, I'm Tyler Wong. And I'm Gary Cohen. And thanks for joining us on the Bridging the Gap series.